They arrested him. He was the editor of a Republican-leaning paper, he printed some nasty things about John Adams. They put him in jail. They never even got to bring him to trial. They actually died in jail of yellow fever. They also arrested a sitting U.S. congressman from Vermont who made some disparaging remarks about the party in power during his campaign. Imagine that. They arrested him. He ended up winning his seat while in jail, serving out his term because he was convicted of the Sedition Acts. Well, it doesn't take a constitutional lawyer to figure out that having a law saying that you can't criticize the other party has a little bit of a, a problem there with that whole First Amendment freedom of speech thing. So the Republicans that were out of power, chief among them Je uh, Thomas Jefferson, who at the time was vice president. And if you notice what I read, the one person that you were still allowed to criticize in the federal government, the vice president. Nice, huh? So Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, hold on a second. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison came up with two resolutions. Jefferson pinned the first one. Ultimately, put in the hands of a, a representative from Kentucky, which I happen to be from Kentucky, so I'm very proud of this. His name was John Breckinridge. And he had this uh, resolution that was ultimately passed through the uh, Kentucky legislature. And basically what it was, it was a nullification bill. The resolution went through, meticulously laid out the case against the Alien and Sedition Acts, laid out the powers delegated to the federal government, are few and defined, and it said these aren't some of them, and therefore they are not legal, they are null and void. And actually, in the original draft that Jefferson wrote, he wrote this, he said, where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy, that every state has a natural right in cases not within the compact of the Constitution to nullify of their own authority all assumptions of power by others within their limits. Now that particular phrase, and you're going to get a lot of people if you start talking about nullification, say, oh, I didn't really mean that nullification thing because Breckenridge had that part taken out of the resolution that was ultimately passed. Interesting reason why he did that, though. In fact, in Kentucky, they were on the verge of revolution. There were several, and I actually found some of these in an old Kentucky newspaper, there were several resolutions that were passed by Kentucky militia units basically saying, you try to enforce this in the state of Kentucky, we're coming after you. So Breckenridge was trying to find a, a middle ground, a way to make a strong stand, but not fan the flames quite to the point where it ended up being a shooting war. So they also understood that when you say that a law is null, a void, and of no effect, you're in essence saying it's nullified. So they took that language out. But if anybody wants to kind of try to throw that at you and say they didn't really mean nullification, in 1799, Kentucky passed a, a second resolution, and in that resolution, that language was included. So that was passed very quickly by the Kentucky legislature. And not long after that, Madison had a, uh, a resolution or a series of resolutions that he penned that were uh, passed through the Virginia legislature. And he used a little bit different terminology. He said, in the case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact or the Constitution, the states who are parties thereto have a right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. So he talked about it in terms of interposition, but he basically did the same thing. He said, these laws are not within the powers of Congress to pass. Therefore, they are unconstitutional acts and not laws at all. And they're void by definition. So this kind of brings us to, to a question. Who decides? Well, Jefferson addressed this in the Kentucky Resolution. He said, whenever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. And he goes on, he says, the government created by this compact of the Constitution was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, since that would have made its discretion and not the Constitution the measure of its powers. But that as in all other cases of a compact among powers having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself as well as of infractions as of the mode and measure of redress. Of redress. So basically what Madison, or what Jefferson was saying, is that the Supreme Court can't be the final decider of the powers of the federal government because it's part of the federal government. 
It'd be kind of like those of you who are hockey fans. Any hockey fans in here? Any Flyers fans? Yeah. Imagine this, you got a game, you got the Flyers and the Rangers. And somebody decides, hey, this dude on the Rangers, he's going to be the ref. Yeah. Really? No. It's ludicrous. And that's what Jefferson's saying. And we're seeing that in action today. We've got this health care, this health care monstrosity that was passed. It's clearly unconstitutional. There's no delegated powers for the federal government to run a health care system. So people say, well, we're going to take it to the Supreme Court. Now look at it like this. The absurdity of all of this is expecting the Supreme Court, which is part of the federal government, that has justices that were appointed by the president, part of the federal government, approved by the Senate, part of the federal government. They're going to make a determination about the powers of Congress, part of the federal government, about the powers of the federal government. It doesn't work. And in fact, it hasn't worked. You know, between, I think it was 19... 36 in 1995, the federal Supreme Court not ever one time ruled any power of Congress unconstitutional. Are you kidding me? Are you mean to tell me that in that entire span of history, there wasn't something that the federal government did that was unconstitutional? It doesn't work. So there has to be, and this is what Jefferson and Madison were saying, there has to be some other mode. There has to be some other check on federal power, or it's just going to expand and expand and expand and expand, which is just what we've seen. Now the next argument you're going to get is, well, that's going to create chaos. You can't do that. It's a lot of chaos if the states start deciding. Really? And what do we have now? Yeah. <laughs> we've got a federal government that thinks it can do anything it wants to. Literally, there is a congressman from Kentucky, John Yarmouth, Democrat, Louisville District. He's on a radio show not long after the health care bill passed. And the radio show host, she asked him, she says, so, you know, if the federal government can tell you that you have to purchase ins insurance, what power does the federal government not have? And, and God bless him for his honesty. He sat there for a minute and thought about it. He goes, well, I guess there's really not any power under the Commerce Clause that the federal government doesn't have. They think this. So it's going to have to happen at the state level. 